Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back to Anderson Ranch. It's good to see so many friends in the room. Uh, my name is Peter Wanders. I'm the president and CEO here at the ranch. So on behalf of the trustees uh, and our staff, we're thrilled uh, to have all of you here. Uh, we really like to start our events by recognizing uh, the legacy that we want to honor. This is um, the ancestral tribal lands of the Ute people. Um, we really want to continue to honor that legacy by making sure that we are a welcoming and inclusive place. And we ask all of you really to join us in that, meet somebody new today, wander through the studios. A lot of that has to do with how we present ourselves to others. So please reach out, get to know the people around you. We all share that love of art and art making here at the ranch. And it's a really special thing. So I ask you to join us in that. I wanted to share quickly a note that we have um, a critical dialogue next week. That's our small seminars. This is a half day with a lunch at the end next Monday. Uh, it is on uh, art and the environment, considering climate change. Uh, it's featuring the artists Alan Michelson and Mary Mattingly. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Miranda Macy from the um, Brooklyn's Climate Change Museum. Just a really great time to come talk about kind of the intellectual side of art, that thought leadership side of art, and really look at where it's starting to impact uh, issues around our lives this year, really focusing on the environment. Um, please join us next week for our um, summer series lecture. Julia Phillips will be here. I know it's a busy week with Art Crush, but please find the time to wander over here. Bring some friends over on Thursday. We'd love to see you. Um, I want to get our uh, lecture started by really acknowledging um, Melanie and Adam Lewis underwrite this series. They do so in honor of Toby Devon Lewis. Many of you know her um, and her legacy in this town. She was the curator of the Progressive Collection, really an early supporter of a lot of emerging artists. And we are thrilled to have her here. She was a board member at the ranch uh, for many years. We have some individual sponsors I want to acknowledge as well. Liza and John Mauck underwrite this series. Rona and Jeff Cit Citrin, Eleanor and Domenico Di Soleil, Sherry and Joe Felsen. I know a lot of you guys are in the room here. Reggie and Lee Smith underwrite that, uh, this series for us as well, so super excited about that. United Airlines is our, culture, or is our uh, travel partner. Cultured Magazine is our media partner, and we want to acknowledge them as well. So with no long, more ado, my colleague Douglas Fogel is curator in residence. He's programmed this summer for us. He did so last summer as well. I'm going to pass over to Douglas to lead our conversation, but thank you all for being here. And a uh, quick round of applause to welcome Douglas and uh, Paul. Oh, thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. I am delighted to have uh, an old colleague and friend, Paul Pfeiffer, here with us today. Paul and I met some 20 years ago, never had a real opportunity to work directly together, but tangentially were around each other. Uh, he showed at the Walker Art Center when I was a curator there with another curatorial colleague. Um, we came across our path, each other's paths when he showed at the project, a very influential gallery in New York that gave Paul and many other artists um, their first kind of major representation. Um, Paul uh, was born just briefly um, because many of you know his work and his reputation, but poor, Paul was born in Honolulu and was raised in the Philippines, but also lived at the end of high school um, in New Mexico, correct? Yeah. Um, and he received his BFA from the school, of, sorry, the San Francisco Art Institute, an institution, sadly, that is no longer with us. And then his MFA from Hunter College in New York uh, in 1994, and attended the, the quite prestigious and influential Whitney Independent Study Program from 1997 to 1998. He's exhibited around the world, uh, has been collected by major uh, institutions. Um, he was the initial recipient of the first Buxbaum Award in the, the 2000 uh, Whitney um, uh, Biennial. Um, and he, this fall in Los Angeles, will be the subject of a mid-career uh, solo survey uh, at MOCA, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles that will open this coming November. So I'd like to welcome you, Paul. And I wanted just to start by mentioning um, two thinkers who you mentioned frequently in your work, just to set the stage before I ask you the first question. But the French theorist who was writing in the 60s, Guy Debord, uh, who was a so-called situationist, famously talked about the idea of the spectacle of, of images and the image culture as being not simply a collection of images that we're inundated with, but actually as a social relationship among people that was mediated by images. And this seems to be really at the core of so much of what you've been doing over the last 20 plus years. And the other thinker is Franz Fanon, the, the sort of progenitor of what we now think of as post-colonial studies, 
um, who very famously discussed the idea of the image of the colonial subject in the colonizer's world being one of which having to learn to live as an image for other people. This idea of being a person but being hyper aware of one's image. So these things seem to be the kind of vectors that have gone through your work from the very beginning. But what I would like to ask you to start with is how did you come to the moving image as your primary kind of area of interest and, and investigation? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for bringing up those two names. Um, yeah, you know, it was a, in a way it was a, um, a kind of an arbitrary thing. I, my uh, background is really in printmaking. Uh, when I went to the San Francisco Art Institute, I studied specifically screen printing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I guess in retrospect, I gravitated that way partially because there was something about the, the kind of mechanical process and the iteration, the repetition, the layering associated with printmaking that was somehow a kind of material language that uh, uh, resonated with me. But I also thought of printmaking as, um, in a way, related to its existence outside of the art world. And so there was an idea that it was uh, a medium that uh, was more sort of populist in a way, or that spoke to <clears throat> everybody or exists in street signs or in advertising or in poster making. Um, but then in the late 90s, when I uh, was living in New York, um, I encountered a computer. And the first time I saw a computer, it was a friend who was working for an advertising agency. And they showed me, I think, Quark Express. And I was like, wow, that's like printmaking on steroids. <laughs> um, and so uh, after grad school, I, um, I got a job teaching at uh, Parsons. And at the time, they were just bringing computers uh, into the school, as all schools were in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. And they were also building this thing called Digital Foundation, uh, which was just to like give freshmen some kind of basis to start exploring digital tools. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew anything about anything. And I remember that the director of Digital Foundation said, you don't have to know anything. Just be one week ahead of, of the whatever students. you're teaching the students. <laughs> yeah, so I started playing with Photoshop and then yeah. started playing with uh, Premiere. Oh, yeah. That's how I got into it. Okay. I, really, I have no background in filmmaking. It was really an extension of kind of, like the computer is almost like a powerful form of printmaking. And then suddenly here was a kind of moving image version of it. And you had another job before that, though, when you were in graduate school. Weren't you working for... Weren't you scanning images? Yes, yeah. Who was that for? And uh, it was a place called Lang Graphics. Okay. And, um, you know, in Midtown or like sort of the Chelsea area of New York, there were all these post-production houses that would scan your photographs for you uh, and print them out for you. And of course, now all of this stuff you just do at home. Right. Um, but uh, at the time, you couldn't do it on your own. Um, so. And it was a time where, when this shift was happening that people who had been producing images, photography studios and whatnot, advertising firms, were like, like rapidly trying to get things digitized. Yeah. And you were kind of there doing it in a way. I find that, that connection to your history with printmaking also kind of interesting to that larger social question of the image. It was a very, in a way, it was a very short window. It kind of went you know, from everything analog to almost overnight, uh, things having to migrate to digital uh, you know, into digital tools. And, you know, places like Lanographics were charging, I think, like 100 bucks a scan. Oh, wow. And so, you know, everybody that, anybody that had any kind of photo archive from, like, magazines to, you know, Getty Images, everybody was just mass scanning their analog film into okay. digital form. Wow. And then a, a few years later, I remember Lanographics and everything like them just kind of went bankrupt. Because sort of that moment of transition was over. It was the same thing with DVDs. Mm. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, another another question. No, I think I, I, when I was reading, and we had been talking about this, I remembered that you know Barbara Kruger and Richard Prince both worked in 
image archives before they became artists or while they were students. Barbara, I think, worked for Condé Nast and Richard for Time Life or vice versa. I did but not they were know working that. with images, and Barbara, I think, was clipping images for like physical files that they would keep images from. But then when, was the, when did you go from printmaking, from then you were teaching the digital to your first moving image work? Um, yeah, 1998, uh, 99. I was literally, I, I taught Photoshop classes basically, or sort of Photoshop, Illustrator, um, just the basics in, in this digital foundation program at Parsons. And then uh, when I was done teaching, uh, it was one of my privileges as a kind of adjunct faculty that I could go to the student lab and use the computers. Mm -hmm. And I remember having kind of one of my first shows at the time mm -hmm. and I had this idea to take a piece of found footage and um, to just accentuate it by removing some of the elements from this scene, which was a basketball scene. And um, I, so I was in the student lab trying to do that, and I couldn't perfect it. I remember being really kind of uh, frustrated. Um, yeah, but that's Fragment of a Crucifixion. It ended up like a year later being in the Whitney Biennial. So, that, so you were working at night at, on your day job. Yeah. And that's, then very quickly, you were, this work was put in the Whitney Biennial in, in 2000, and you yeah. won the Buxbaum Award for it. It all happened like Not just bad. right on the cusp of kind of this digital transition. But can you tell us then about that first body of work that you were looking at? Because many of us who know the work well associate your early work with the um, iconography and the spectacle of sports, um, especially uh, basketball, boxing, so w this is what you were looking at right then. Yeah, um, like around that time, late 90s, uh, I, you know, I was living in New York and um, the NBA, well, uh, they had just rebooted the WNBA. Mm -hmm. And um, so friends of mine, it wasn't even me, it wasn't on my radar, but friends of mine were like, you know, we gotta go support, like, this is a big deal. Um, and so we went to Madison Square Garden and would watch WNBA games. And the first time I went to Madison Square Garden, I was just like, whoa. Because uh, I don't come from a sports, like a family that is really into sports. You're not a fan. I, I just wasn't raised that way. Yeah. And, you know, my, my, my uh, parents were both musicians. If anything, they were taking us to, you know, see symphonic concerts. Or, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and so in some ways, I, I feel like the, the lack of a connection in a way, um, and the kind of the strangeness, the, the lack of familiarity with the scenario is what made it so spectacular to me. Hmm. The idea of people performing on a court with uh, like all the lights and the sound uh, surrounding it, um, and the sense that it was like big money and just kind of a, a real, scene, just the idea of concentration of vision on these like almost naked bodies on the court. Yeah. Just uh, honestly, it reminded me of the paintings of Francis Bacon. Yeah. That's why. what I was, yeah, I mean, because I know we've men you've mentioned that to me before. Tell me about that. What's that connection to Bacon that you saw? Yeah, I mean, it was really, you know, I mean, I think of Bacon as being, uh, what appealed to me is that the, the idea that he was taking like very unfamiliar material from different sources, uh, and specifically that he was uh, interested in the whole history of figuration and religious painting, but then mixing it with stills from film. Uh, you know, the screaming head from uh, Battleship Potemkin. Um, and he was one of the first modern post-war painters who was looking at images from the media yes. in his work. I, it's funny because I never really, you know, you wouldn't necessarily associate that with what right. his work looks like. But. Yeah, because he's, in a way he was a classicist as well. Yeah. And I, I look back and think about it. Um, yeah, and in, in a way it's also to me like a, a European expression of pop mm -hmm. um, as opposed to an American expression of 
pop, which is more familiar. What's that? Oh, you can pull the um, thing out of your pocket. The, oh, really? The, the cutting in and out itself. Uh, oh, thanks. Is this better? Thank you. Is that okay? Oh, okay. I, I thought I heard that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying about bacon. Sorry. I... Um, that's the main thing. And maybe the last thing I'll say is that, you know, obvious, I mean, also there's just something very immediate about Bacon's painting, something very visceral. It is figurative, but there are these kind of disintegrating figures. Um, they're very graphic, um, you know, against these kind of very flat kind of color field backgrounds. There's this kind of eruption of flesh that happens. Um, to me, it was all very provocative. And literally, one of the things I, I, I thought when I went to a basketball game for the first time is that you know, the court is like that graphic background, and at the center of which is this sort of eruption of sweat and flesh. Yeah, the, paint, the, the, the plane of the painting, the, yeah. the canvas, in a way. Yeah. Um, should we look at a couple of images that kind of from yeah. this moment? And so these, works? yeah, I, and, and um, so I'm starting with just a, an installation shot of these earliest. There was actually two videos that I did at, in the same year. One was called The Pure Products Go Crazy. And that's a close-up of the armature on the wall. And it's and, important to note the scale. You were taking something from a spectacular situation, both televisually but also in, yeah. in the, the, the stadium. And you're bringing it down to this tiny, tiny intimate kind of projector. Yeah. In a way, I thought the first thing you would see is the armature. You wouldn't yet see what it is, but you would be there's a light, and so you would have to come close, almost like you were peeping. Uh, so there was almost like a kind of perversity to the act of looking. Um, and On the left, what are we looking at? So these the so in in 2000 at the uh, Whitney Biennial, uh, I got to be in a room, and these were two small armatures on opposite walls in a room. So almost kind of like bookends. Um, Do you recognize the one on the right? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so I thought in a way, uh, scenario-wise or like kind of situation-wise, what I liked about these two images as bookends is that um, they're very different architectures. One is the stadium, and the other one is a kind of um, like domestic living room space. Um, such extreme different vibes. But in some ways, they, uh, in a way, um, represent the two ends of a pipeline um, uh, of broadcasting. So in the stadium, the images are shot, and then they get piped into the living room. Uh, so in a way, it, yeah, there's, and then, you know, so you have the armatures kind of disappearing into the wall, uh, and in a way, what's between them is this kind of uh, invisible infrastructure of uh, broadcasting or image production. And they were meant to just sort of, it's uh, just loop forever. Um, which, of course, now is the kind of native way that we look on video, uh, videos on our uh, phones. But you know, this was before phones, so in a way, it was like a pre-meme meme. I, I, yeah. Should I go on? Yeah, yeah, this please. Yeah, keep going. Around the same time, it's uh, this. Uh, it's like a little Sony, one of the first pocket uh, cameras that Sony made. Um, yeah, and I. Put it in a in a armature or like a case that I thought of as being like a, something you might find in a natural history museum. And again, it just plays on a loop. It's a scene from the Bulls winning. Is it their sixth? They won six with Jordan. They won six. So I'm not sure which one this would be, but. Uh, it would have played forever, but yeah, I just, uh, the title of the work was Race Riot, and it was really, um, has nothing to do with the race riot, um, but I, I was thinking about 
Warhol's use of the race riot image is to, you know, to produce a kind of um, effect that has different layers to it. Um, yeah. yeah. In the 60s, with uh, Warhol's self-screen paintings, he took images from Life magazine of a, uh, a protest that was broken up by police in Alabama. And they very famously became the race riot silkscreen paintings. Yeah. What he called the race riots. Um, so there was something about like the, the gesture of taking something you know, uh, out of one context and putting it into another that I identified but with. Um, but of course, you know, to me, there, there's also the distance of 60 years, or, yeah. or at that point, 40 years, I guess. Yeah. Uh, w one more from that period is, this is a piece called um, The Long Count. And once again, like, everything is behind the wall. It's just the kind of tip of the pipe that comes out of the wall. And There's actually uh, three different videos, all presented the same way as a kind of triptych. Uh, three fights of Muhammad Ali. Uh, in each case, it was a knockout round. And this is me now exploring further what could be done sort of Photoshop-wise on moving images, um, using a process called rotoscoping. Very simple. It's kind of from the history of animation. It's basically frame by frame. Uh, editing. Um, Much easier now. You know, as we know, as we like know. Uh, now there are algorithms that do it. Although, yeah. you know, I, yeah, the next. Well, can we stop one second? Because what I would like to point out, these are from three iconic Muhammad Ali yes. fights. So throughout the course of his career. And I think what would be interesting to talk about a little bit is Technically, you're talk, telling about being able to erase the bodies, but I'd like you to talk a little bit, if you could explain or expound a little bit on this idea of erasure in your work, because it is a really important trope and a technique that you use is erasing the body, yet the ghost remains. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and how that first, I mean, uh, you know, more philosophically, how that kind of you came to that and yeah. what that means for you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in some ways, I feel like it's a mere, uh, like a material fundamental of editing, um, or even of printmaking, um, in that in, in printmaking, as in editing, uh, particularly this kind of editing, um, what, which is like special effects editing, um, the image is broken down into layers. And you essentially have a foreground layer and a background layer. And the foreground and the background interact. Um, and, and in a way, this is a, a kind of also a fundamental of perception. So I mean, what, what interested me is that in, in a way, in an editing room, you're anticipating the image that will then be presented um, and the effect that the image will have. Like if you're telling a story, the precise sequence that you uh, set up from image to image to tell the story um, of a very specific effect. And if you change the duration of one shot by a second, it could produce a very different effect. So it's in a way, it's a endlessly kind of uh, manipulable um, material, which ultimately then interacts in real time with a kind of the perception of the viewer. So in the editing room, you get to sort of take it out of the real time and break it down to almost like a, a, like a particle level and, and, and play with it before speeding it back up to real time for somebody to see. And so what's happening here, like it, what looks like erasure is actually a process of taking pieces of background and 
putting it on top of the figure, mm -hmm. almost like uh, camouflage. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, I find it really, like I think a lot about how uh, insects um, or octopuses, various, you know, the, the, the ways in which uh, different organisms like interact with the background and that um, the idea that this somehow has to do with self-protection or for various kind of like biological functions that um, would benefit the entity. But in, in a similar way, I think um, you could transpose foreground, background, and its manipulation for reasons of self-protection or whatever to um, <clears throat> a scenario of like human subjectivity. Um, in a way, the foreground is like the ego and the background is like the environment. And in a way, the, the ego exists not by itself, but always in relation to its environment. And in a way, it, it modulates itself to adapt or to um, sort of, you know, uh, to, to shape its environment. So um, for me, it, it just opens up like a lot of very interesting questions and I, and I like the idea that the familiarity of the scenario of sports would provide a kind of intuitive entry point, but that what you get once you're there is not what you expect, but uh, could be a deep dive into this area of um, like identity and its uh, construction in a way. And denying the image in a way. I mean, it's denying the image of Ali in a way, and, and the mimicry with the crowd, it's, you're kind of frustrating or short-circuiting the connection between the, oh, the idea of the spectacle, yeah. of the scenario of a, a, a boxing <coughs> match, people watching, it being broadcast, these two bodies moving and trying to you know, hit each other and, and whatnot, so. I mean, in a way, you know, what you have in a boxing match is just a primal yeah. battle scene. And in a way, it's one against the other, and somebody's going to win and someone's going to lose. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it opens up a lot of questions about, you know, how you, um, like who those two people are, you know, and the rumble of the jungle, which is what, oh no, this is Thrill in Manila. But, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali was like a very specific kind of hero. Yeah. And anybody up against him, in some ways, was already a kind of anti hero. Um, so the question, you know, to me, like what's playing out visually is a kind of a dramatization mm -hmm. of the hero, which is already meant to be a point of one-to-one -one identification with the viewer. So to withhold the hero mm -hmm. um, would be almost like um, suppressing a kind of natural, like, plot to the story. Um, it's like teaching freshmen intro to film it's horrific. <laughs> they get so angry at you when you take apart the narrative, the cinematic features, the editing right. for the first like month or so until they kind of. But get then to they joy. can never see a movie they, again. They can never see a movie any way else again. They can never see it without thinking about it. But although this is also in a way, you, you're in a way you're opening up a kind of greater sophistication. Yes. About about storytelling, and I I thought in a way. Ultimately, I don't have to break it down in any way. It's just presenting the image, and you can make up, yeah. you know, whatever you want to see in it. Yeah. What's next after this? Sorry, you were. So yeah, fast Sorry. forward to this is like 2018 or 2019. Um, I explored a bunch of other stuff uh, in the in, in 20 years, but somewhere uh, in the late uh, 20 teens, um, I. It occurred to me that now, as opposed to then, you could just get like tons of footage of boxing on YouTube. And the, like, the image making tools around shooting uh, boxing matches has increased so exponentially. Now it's in 4K and 8K. The slow motion images are incredible. So in a way, the, the intimacy of the spectacle of violence is, is, is that much greater. And the footage, uh, I don't even have to work very hard to like get the footage down. Mm -hmm. 
it circulates. So, so yeah, I sort of reinvented the long count with a, um, the long counts of work, yeah. Which were the Muhammad Ali yeah. pieces, and uh, just kind of went back to the scene of boxing and tried a different approach. This is one of a number of uh, karyatid pieces that I've done. There's a series called Karyatid, and I think we should explain the title. Sure. Uh, if you could talk about that, because it's a classical piece of architecture, correct? Yeah, yeah Karyatid, at some point, you know, in some ways, uh, the idea of like a connection between kind of material culture, um, whether it's the moving image or, you know, object making or architecture, that it carries a kind of like psychological and a societal kind of code within it, uh, really intrigued me. And I started uh, reading about classical architecture in the first chapter of uh, um, Vitruvius's 10 books of architecture, uh, he talks about the story of the Caryatids. Um, you know, these are the six figures that appear on what's called the Persian porch on the Acropolis. Um, they were created like, you know, 2,000 years ago and more uh, and remain as these kind of like emblems of Western culture. Uh, in, in Greece, and the story behind them I found so fascinating, because uh, apparently there was a moment where one of the city-states in the area um, state, uh, staged a rebellion. Against Athens. Against Athens, and they failed. Um, and this was considered you know, the, the ultimate um, uh, betrayal. And so the, the punishment was severe for um, the citizens of Carrie. Um, and it entailed uh, killing all the generals and then um, making all the wives of the generals into slaves, uh, parading them through town. But that wasn't enough. They wanted to sort of memorialize this kind of humiliation for all time. And they did that by creating effigies of the wives of the general, and that's what those six figures and are. And installing them in the, in, the, in, in, in the Acropolis. Yeah. As, as sculptural. The idea that this would be the monument that would last for all time, and so their sort of their betrayal and their humiliation uh, would be memorialized for all time. Um, so what's also interesting to me is that among the classical orders, uh, the columns are all abstract forms. And there's, I think, six or seven different classical orders. Um, the karyatids are the these are the only columns that are literally simultaneously human uh, figures. They're figures, and they're also architectural elements. Yeah, yeah. So there's this, in a way, the act of representing as opposed to abstraction is connected with this scenario of a kind of ultimate uh, punishment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you called this series that based on this idea. If you could tell us about how that. Yeah, sort of um, it was just thinking about again, like the the relationship of the figure to to the background, or in this case, the ring. Uh, like on the Persian porch, the human figure acts as a kind of like armature that holds up the you know the building. And that was the idea. You know, for all time, they would carry the weight of civilization. Mm. Um, and so there's this idea that somehow, like, the, the monuments of the victors are a kind of weight which is carried by the defeated. So going back to Franz Fanon, like, how that translates into a kind of, like, uh, a kind of, like, psychological, um, I don't know, like, uh, point of view yeah. or... Uh, or, or relationality. Um, again, I'm not claiming to understand it, just in yeah. some ways like thinking about yeah. how these relationships uh, are in, encoded in material culture and, and, and in a way try to take the familiar and defamiliarize it to raise questions about like how this coding exists. And with this work, I mean, one of the boxers is not there. 
Exactly. So you see one body in motion with the other, and then against the corner it becomes as almost an architectural figure yeah. in the same sense, I guess. Yeah. But the idea that this, this literally this icon of Western civilization is built, of course, upon slavery. Yeah, I mean, I sense. should say also, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, at some point, I realized that uh, another interpretation of the word karyatid uh, is that it's a sort of uh, ornamental figure that's been interpreted throughout the 20th century and appears in a lot of architecture um, um, and is, sometime, you know, is, is sometimes explicitly referred to as image of a slave and sometimes sort of passes without you knowing that that's what that figure originally was meant was, to be. Yeah. On a totally different note, <laughs> as, uh, yeah, in a way like, uh, I mean, I've always, sports has been like a, a continuing fascination. I've also kind of, in a way, seen it as like a scene of perception and a scene of like social relations kind of in a very concentrated form, but certainly not the only one. And, and so I've been, try, you know, I've, I've always done other work, although it seems like the sports stuff has like really stuck. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this is an early film, I mean, or a video, and I put it right in this point because I, I just wanted to, like to me, the idea of erasing both boxers or erasing one boxer as a way to kind of defamiliarize this very familiar scenario uh, just raises this, the specter of some kind of, of the work of the editor as a kind of invisible uh, like dimension of things. Um, and, and, and in a way, I think it's you know, in a way become all the more important in, in our information age, the, the possibilities, or in our social media age, hmm. you know, the, the kind of the invisible labor which has now become very democratized. And in a way, we have be all, you know, we're all becoming quite skillful at, at doing playing with these invisible tools um, and the effects that they can produce. Uh, so the, in, in a way, this is a very simple kind of editing piece that's of two sunset, uh, two images, one a sunset and one a sunrise, both shot on Cape Cod, um, looking east and then looking west. So I thought in some ways it's sort of the two edges of the earth and they been taken and in the edit studio, um, <clears throat> one of them's turned upside down and the two horizon lines have been uh, kind of sandwiched together. So that black line you're looking at is actually the easternmost and westernmost edge of the earth um, put together. And as the sun sets upside down on one side into the ocean, it's simultaneously uh, rising on the other side in real time, and in a sense, you have the eclipse of the Earth mm -hmm. happening. There's no ground to stand on in this picture. You're somehow floating in this kind of impossible post-production space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, the title, Morning After the Deluge, um, is borrowed from a William J. Turner painting. Yeah. And he's describing the, the biblical you know, scene of after the flood. So editing, you once described editing as apocalyptic and the, and the way in which our contemporary culture, the hyperness of it now and the uncriticality we have towards it. I wonder if you could expound on that a little bit. What do you mean by apocalyptic? I mean, you know, in a way, it just, it's not the, to me like the literal apocalypse. apocalypse. It's more like Um, the end of a certain world that we know and, and the beginning of a new world that we don't know. Um, like now, like, you know, this was made in 2003 and 20 years later, I feel like it's most obvious to identify the apocalypse with, say, like AI. But in some ways, I think the potentials 
to me, were already um, like uh, produ provocative in the materiality of the digital in, in 2020. The idea that you could take an image and loop it into a kind of non-narrative, repetitive pulse um, that could last because it's digital forever. The idea of like the birth of a new kind of temporality of infinity in the digital was super suggestive. It's uh, 20 minutes, so I... No, we yeah. can move on. <laughs> we can definitely move on. There's a couple more pieces we want to get to before uh, our final question, but um, if you want to go through a couple... Yeah, just really quickly, um, on a super different note. Um, there's, yeah, like I grew up in the Philippines, and in some ways, like, um, in a way, it's always, in a way, been uh, a thought that, from the perspective of the Philippines that has such a long relationship throughout the 20th century um, with the United States. Um, and you know, both my parents and my grandparents were associated with a uh, historic school in the Philippines um, that goes back to 1901. Um, a university or? Yeah, it's called Silliman University. It was uh, founded on a grant um, from a, uh, a person named Horace B. Silliman, who also uh, was the founder of um, Hamilton College in upstate New York, okay. uh, a mining family. Um, and he gave $10,000 in, in 1901 yeah. to found a school in the Philippines. And it's there to this day. I've taught there. My parents were both right. at different periods uh, directors of the music school. My grandfather was the director of the chemistry program. Really? Wow. So in a way, like that's a kind of like home ground for me. Yeah. And um, uh, growing up in the Philippines, you know, in a way like, uh, <clears throat> there's a way in which like American culture was refracted through um, experiencing it, you know, through television or uh, just culturally from the other side of the world. Um, so I've always thought, you know, to, in, in a way, a big part of my practice is sort of coursing my like ideas through the materiality of working uh, with um, craftspeople and video editors in the Philippines. Um, and this piece is, uh, I won't even explain it, but basically this is, there's, I, I'm, I'm working with a, a college age uh, group of students at the American University in 2005 here, and uh, they're doing a kind of performance called Speech Choir, which uh, all I'll say is that I, I've done a little investigative work, and apparently the tradition of Speech Choir comes from Rudolf Steiner. Oh. Uh, he originally developed it at the turn of the century in Germany as a kind of uh, self-presentation exercise for actors. Steiner was the founder of Waldorf Education. He was an educator and a, a philosopher. Yeah. So what's happening here is we're taking the famous 1992, I think, broadcast of Michael Jackson. He used his own money to go on TV and, um, and broadcast his innocence. And I always thought of this text as like almost like a, almost like a Greek tragedy, hmm. a monologue from a Greek tragedy. And through this form of speech choir in the Philippines, uh, reproducing.
It's a bit hard to hear. Um, but basically, we transcribed the statement uh, that Michael Jackson made, and it became a kind of script that was um, practiced by this group of 100 students. And they spent several months practicing it until they were able to speak it together in one voice. So they're, in some ways, to me, like they're the Greek chorus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I've sort of manipulated the speed of the image of Michael Jackson to match uh, their, the lilt of their uh, voices, speaking as one. Yeah, another, this is a, a, you're looking at a sculpture that's called Perspective Study, uh, a kind of a diorama of a jungle scene with a tent in the middle. It's a miniature in scale. And um, it's a two-part piece. The, the, the other piece is uh, it's like a, a kind of a massive projection screen with this uh, image of the tent. Um, nothing's happening, but if you sort of, if you, look at it long enough, you would start to see a little bit of movement in the shadows, and it, uh, the relationship between the two parts is that uh, there is a little security camera in the diorama. So as people moved around the diorama, you would see their shadows kind of projecting a little bit on the tent. And it's a sort of like different perspectives. Like whatever the tent is, it's, it's sort of a symbol of somebody who's in a terrain that's in which they are like roughing it. And so this is like the view from the trees. Um, uh, this is a piece called uh, Vitruvian Figure <laughs> from, you know, Vitruvius, the 10 books of architecture. Um, and <clears throat> it was made for a the Sydney Biennial in 2007. Um, it's based on the Olympic Stadium in Sydney, uh, which holds 100,000 people. Um, and I worked with the architectural uh, firm that built the Olympic Stadium. Um, this is a sculpture. Yeah. That's important to point out. <laughs> yeah. It is. You'll see in a second, in the next. It's like a massive. Uh, um, architectural model. Yeah. The idea was to imagine the City Olympic Stadium expanded by tenfold to hold a million people. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and then it was produced, it was just a production shot. Wow. In a way, it's like a giant piece of jewelry. Yeah, wow. Um, so in a, in a way, I'm showing it to you because it's, in some ways, the Philippines becomes the scenario for kind of invisible labor. Uh, in some ways, they think of the million seats, and then this basically like a, a this expanded team of specifically women fabricators. Um, in a way, their ghosts sort of then fill the stadium through these million mm. seats. Mm. Uh, the next couple of slides are from a series of photographs called uh, uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse." So these are very large-scale photographs, correct? Yeah. yeah. They're about five, uh, uh, five, five or six feet apiece. They're all coming out of the NBA photo archive. And then and you've neutralized any kind of team uh, insignias and... Yeah. Uh, I mean, every single one of these is, you know, they're extremely well-known yeah. Hall of Famer basketball players. This is... Um, Bill Russell, uh, the last shot was, um, I mean, it's one of the most famous shots in history. It's uh, the last uh, one? Yeah. Oh, can you go back? Um, I only, Joe can go back. Uh, Patrick Ewing. Oh, it's Patrick Ewing, OK. But obviously, you know, all the <coughs> team markers that would sort of identify are taken out. Some people, hardcore basketball fans, can still recognize who it is. But in some ways, to me, it's similar to the erasure of, of um, the boxers in the sense that it's taking 
an image that everything about it is meant to centralize the hero. So then to take away the hero's identity is a particularly like, uh, like defamiliarizing gesture. Uh, and so I want to, this is the end of, or, or almost the end. Um, the most recent, one of the most recent projects I've been working on is a project called Incarnator, which is like a kind of Anglophone version of the word uh, Incarnador, which is the Spanish term for the craftsman who makes religious images. Icons. Yeah, and it literally means uh, like Incarnador is like the flesh maker um, and refers to you know, the final step. This is, these are images made out of wood that are then polychromed. Um, and I'm working with probably the most famous Incarnador in the Philippines, a guy named Willie Layug, um, in one of two provinces that have for 500 years been the centers of uh, this kind of uh, religious image production. Um, I just wanted to show you that that's the way it looks if you put it all together, but the way I actually show the works is uh, disassembled. I mean, all through your work, there is this connection to the history of religious icon iconography in terms of the body. I mean, in, especially within Catholicism or Christianity, yeah. this idea of the indemnification of the body, of the body in pain of the body and suffering, and it, it kind of goes throughout the work, and this is kind of the ultimate kind of re-bringing it back home, as it were. Yeah, um, I mean, it really came about because in 2017, I, I was invited to be at a, a, a residency in the Philippines, very specific, that the part of the um, nature of the residency is that it, um, there was access to craft studios and it occurred to me while I was there that you know, to speak about the tradition of sculpture in the Philippines immediately centralizes the production of these religious images. And it's connected very specifically to you know, uh, the Acapulco trade, um, you know, starting in the mid-1500s. Uh, there was this uh, trade between Spain through Mexico to the Philippines of you know, like spices and various products. Um, very famously, Magellan in the mid 1500s um, brought an image of the baby Jesus to the Philippines, which exists to this day. And oh, a, a physical, uh, a, a sculpture. The Santo Niño. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still there. Okay. So, like in 20, in, it's in a basilica in the southern part of the Philippines. Uh, every January like hundreds of thousands of devotees come. Um, and uh, it's like a power object. Um, it's like a matrix. To me, like the, when I think about it, it's both a child and a king. And so it's both innocence and corruption, or like mm -hmm. innocence and power in one form. Mm. Um, and it's ubiquitous. It's like, uh, arguably, it represents uh, like, pre-Christian deity um, that then takes a Christian form with the arrival of this image. Yeah. But really, it refers to something that predates Christianity. Mm. Um, and so in 2017, uh, it occurred to me, Justin Bieber is like the contemporary. He's the contemporary embodiment of the Santo Nino. Mm. He's both innocent and all-powerful. And he represents you know, the possibility of a kind of like global agency to his generation of children. Hmm. Like they see him and they identify with him and. Did you all recognize that it was Justin Bieber in there? Yeah, okay. Right. And it was also in 20s, around this time that he started tattooing himself, starting with, with Son of God. Yeah. And came out as born again and began mm -hmm. using his concerts to proselytize as a born again Christian. So uh, it, it, this is an ongoing project, and I, I'm basically working with Encarnadores in 
Manila and now Seville and Mexico City. And Mexico City, yeah. To expand this kind of body of sculptures, kind of treating these existing studios as kind of found situations. And it's sort of take all of the existing formulas and just add Justin Bieber's face to it. So it's still Justin Bieber? It's basically all the stations of the Got cross. It. OK, we're doing the stations of the cross. OK. Because um, I know we're running short on time, and everyone's yeah. been really patient. I want them to be able to ask questions. But if you could maybe briefly tell us about what you're working on now, maybe we could skip to that, and then we can open it up for questions from the audience. OK. Um, yeah, like, a, right, so I'm uh, just getting ready for this uh, retrospective in uh, LA. and. Um, part of it has to do with like expanding the, the Incarnator series. Um, and uh, part of it has to do with the, excuse me, a project that I uh, started working on in 2016 in Athens, Georgia. Um, and has taken a couple of different forms, like a live performance and, uh, it, and, and also a, a film. And I want to show you a little bit of the film, yeah. if there's time. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, like I, I uh, got to teach at the University of Georgia in the art school, and through the art school, got kind of support to get press passes into the stadium. And um, you know, University of Georgia is one of the top four football schools in the nation, and uh, they're the current champions um, for the second year in a row. Um, <laughs> uh, see some, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and I really, you know, as, as a non-football fan or as somebody who's new to the culture, I just, I thought of it as just like the scene of a certain kind of like mass, uh, mass ritual, like an American mass ritual. And so uh, like over the course of a couple of seasons, I uh, was able to, with, with a small team, um, shoot football games. But instead of focusing on the field, uh, focused on the, um, the band that provides a kind of musical soundtrack during the game and uh, befriended and ha got to collaborate with the director of the band who's an amazing guy named Brett Balcom. Very, very interested, in interesting in that, you know, what he does as the band director has to do with creating emotion in the stadium. So he's, he's kind of, in a way, the puppet master and he becomes like, I, Put the cameras on him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Another kind of director, in a sense, yeah. creating an experience. You know. So I'm just going to play like a few minutes, and then we'll. Yeah, and then we can open it up. Cool. Uh, so this is me now. Like, I'm not just kind of playing camouflage editing anymore. Now I'm sort of constructing a kind of narrative um, through six different camera people who are located around the stadium, and you'll see. It's like the coach calling the plays. Can we turn it up a little bit?
He goes on. I just realized it's like perspective study. Yeah. It's kind of going back. Yeah. Um, we'd love to take questions from the audience. If you could please wait for the microphone and say your name before you, for, the, for the camera, for the live stream, please. Is there any, are there any questions? Up here? Sorry. Oh. Hi, my, na my name is Brian. Sorry. Hello? Hello? Okay. Hi, my name's Brian, and I'm just interested in, in if you can um, say anything about, I mean, I see in like the trajectory of your work from the beginning as a printmaker, which I am also, to these final images where you, I feel like you're sort of, I mean, the, the sculptures that you're now making are sort of the incarnadora, I guess it is. It's like what what you're doing even in the films with the, not only those um, religious figures in the foreground, at times, but with the whole thing. So I, I guess my question is, do you see yourself as like an incarnadore in, in everything you do? Like a, a craftsman taking these, um, these images that have meaning and sort of putting them together or something. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, in a way it's sort of like, I feel like in the age of social media, like every one of us is both manipulating and being manipulated. And, and, but certainly, like I think of the phone as a kind of handheld post-production studio. Hmm. And to me, the skill set of playing with images that has become so like secondhand to us and you know, we all talk about how like babies will uh, swipe before they can even speak. Um, in a way, the, the re-encoding is, is real. And um, yeah, there's just, uh, in a way, it, the material, like in a way the material has to do with consciousness. Um, in a way, the incarnador is someone who has a material practice, but 
in some ways it's in the service of or it interacts with belief systems. So I feel like this describes the, 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 the work of the editor, absolutely. Is there, uh, there's another question up here, up front. Hi, my oh, name, sorry. Oh, so it's okay. My name is Alice, um, and I have a question um, that speaks to, I guess, in this media age and some of your images, which um, you said some were drawn from the archives of the MBA, but some of your earlier images and copyright and getting some of your images, have you run into problems with that? Do you start with getting permissions, or do you just go for it and apologize later? <laughs> yeah. I, the latter. <laughs> um, and the, 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 the truth of the matter is, you know, in some ways, like now we're in the 21st century, um, you know, you mentioned Richard Prince, and I mean, these are, I feel like, you know, uh, the pictures generation artists are to me like my ancestors, and there's more ancestors. But in a way, like, what, what, what those artists of the 20th century will appear to be in the 21st century in relation to copyright is changing very rapidly. Um, and all I can say is in some ways, you know, any questions around ethics or even law that would relate to intellectual property have uh, a kind of like profound analog with just our ordinary lives and the degree to which, you know, we ourselves are as a kind of property are uh, open to similar dynamics. So it's fair game, but I'm just in a way, like I, I feel like in my mind, you know, the, the logic of playing this game it has to do with like really trying to understand what's happening in society and has been happening for centuries in a way. It's a continuum in a sense, because even though the hyper intensification of it with digital media and now we don't know what's gonna happen with AI, the idea of deep fakes of, you know, I, I, I yeah. often wonder what, if I ask chat GBT to write an essay about you in my style, what will it, what right. will it produce? You know, I don't wanna do that. But it's like this idea that somehow the replication of images, this data bank of images that goes back to, by the way, religious iconography, and For sure. the whole history of image making within the global kind of situation. So it's, it's this long, acceleration, slow acceleration that's then sped up, in, you know, infinitely now, so, yeah. in a way. Yeah, and I also just say, like, you know, to me, there isn't time to fully get into it, but in a way there's uh, kind of religious, religious belief systems that uh, are also, you know, there's belief systems in relation to sports, in a way. Um, but the other side of the coin has to do with, uh, in a way, like what the language of, of like the horror film is as a kind of, you know, uh, to me, I was, you know, if we had more time, I would love to talk about The Exorcist. Because, <laughs> you know, to me, in a way, like The Exorcist is a, uh, sort of a, like a religiously framed story about a kind of severe identity crisis. And in some ways, I think in relation <coughs> to AI, we're already, going through or are about to go through a really severe identity crisis. Is there another question? Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much for your um, talk. It's been really moving. And this is kind of a follow-up question to Brian's about the grand editor and the way you're talking about religious systems and beliefs. And can you talk more about the Karyatids I, I was very moved by that film because it had such a timeliness about this country dealing with racism and the way that fighter is so isolated and being beaten and we can't see it because we can't see ourselves. Yeah. Can you speak more about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like you just yeah. said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, all I can say is in some ways, you know, like, well, the, the Karyatid series is something that I started in around 2015. So it was very interesting for me to see um, how the change of context over the past few years uh, 
like changed how people looked at those pieces. Um, and in, in a way, it's something I'm still grappling with, um, and or not grappling with that. You know, in some ways, I feel like there's there's an opportunity there to collaborate with people that are asking these questions and are, um, you know, at the forefront of just creating new frameworks to to go deeper into, um, you know, like um, just um, innovative ways to get past a certain kind of like repetitive um, behaviors or perceptions that now it's become clear we have to. So in a way, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited at the idea that, you know, somehow images like this that are in a way playing on a visual level with, with defamiliarization of the familiar uh, could like serve, you know, like a very real kind of evolution of on a discursive and political level um, that's occurring. One more question? What is it? That... No? No more questions? You guys, you've been so patient. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Paul Pfeiffer. Thank you. And please join us next Thursday. Julia Phillips will be coming in from Chicago, an amazing young sculptor. Please join us next week. Thanks again. Oh. Exhibition that we have in the Welcome Center on the second floor, curated by Sam Harvey. Uh, north, south, east, west, so please check that out. Thank you. Thanks for that question.